So, anyways, this situation is such a mess. Many people here commented about what my cousin would probably do in retaliation, and I was naive about it, because they were exactly right. I last posted on Reddit about my cousin who gave me a junk beach cruiser bike out of his parents' backyard when my mountain bike got stolen. I cleaned up and fixed up the beach cruiser, and then suddenly my cousin wanted me to either pay him $1.60 for it, or give it back because he wanted to sell it after I made it purdy. But the rest of the family, including his parents, basically told him to grow up when he tried to get them involved. Then he found out about my Am I the Jerk post. One of his friends apparently saw it and told him, either here or on a podcast or something, I don't know, but word spread around. The whole family found out because my cousin ranted to them, but none of them are angry with me. They actually sympathized with me for even feeling like I had to make the Am I the Jerk post to begin with when my cousin was so clearly in the wrong. My cousin ended up freaking out over it and confronting me on my way home from work. This time, he demanded even more money for the bike. He said that since I love Reddit so much, he was taking an a-hole tax for humiliating him. And the cost of the bike was now $1.80. He ranted about how paying him $1.80 for the bike was the least I could do after I humiliated him. I refused and said that he was acting like a grifter, and the bike was hardly worth anything. I put in effort to make it rideable, while he let it rot in his parents' backyard for years. It was junk when I started, and I made it work. Then I listed all the things I did to fix it, and how much it would have costed the bike shop to fix it instead. He somehow still didn't see my point, and still stated he wanted the money now, or he'd be taking the bike back whether I liked it or not. I told him I was done with this and tried to ride off, but he grabbed me and pulled both me and the bike over before I could ride away. I said, what the hell man, while I was getting up, and then he actually slugged me in the face. It didn't break my nose but really freaking hurt, and it made me bleed. Then he took my bike and rode off with it. I'm older than my cousin by two years, and taller too, but he's built way sturdier than me since his father is a bit of a husky and strong guy, and he inherited that body type, so he had no problem knocking me down and robbing me. Someone came over to help me up, and then I called the cops. Family or no family, I wasn't about to just let him get away with doing that to me. And the altercation happened right in front of a shop with CCTV, which the cops later got video from. I got taken to the hospital to have my face checked, and my cousin was arrested by police at his apartment. He had the bike there too, and had even already listed it for sale online, but took it down later. Thanks to something someone commented on my last post, I documented the serial numbers of the bike by photographing them and writing them down at home. So I got my bike back from the police without much issue. My cousin tried to tell police the bike was still his, but I had texts on my phone from back when he said I could have it, and lots of other text evidence of the harassment that followed. Plus his parents were there when he gave the bike to me, and the whole family knew he'd tried to grift me, so he surrendered it and the bike was returned to me at the station. My boss gave me a couple days off work to recover. The injury to my nose was thankfully minor, so I'm doing fine. My cousin didn't get off easy though. After he was arrested, he was found to have been drinking. So now he's been charged for theft, assault, and underage drinking since he's not 21 yet. He called his parents to come bail him out, but they refused after finding out what he did to me. They came to see me after a couple days and were extremely apologetic. They said they had no idea he'd do such a jerk move to me. They also said he'd been asking for money a lot lately, and likely was spending that all on his habits. None of us have any idea where he got the alcohol, or what kind of long-term punishment he's in for, but I doubt he's going to get off very lightly from this when he goes to court. I did get questioned about whether or not I can press charges, but the police already have the video of the assault and theft, and my cousin is still getting charged for underage drinking, so no one is really asking me to try and speak on his behalf. I don't really want to either. And since I waited a few days longer to post this, my cousin is now out of jail, and his parents have learned from him that he was also behind on rent, and is now facing eviction since his lease was month to month. He was also fired from his job for being a no-show since he was stuck in jail for a few days. One of my friends works in that same place too, and my cousin had already been on thin ice for bad behavior, a lot of tardiness, and repeatedly not showing up for work. So getting arrested was the last straw for his boss and he was fired. So now he's looking at misdemeanor charges, has no job, and is getting evicted. All because he had to be a jerk and a grifter. From what my parents and his parents tell me, he acted like everything was all my fault. But his parents have shut that down and chewed him out over the fact that he beat me up and stole from me. And this is karma for that. Then they made him promise to leave me alone from here on out. I've heard his parents aren't going to be letting him move back into his old room either. Instead they plan on putting him up in the loft above their garage, which isn't exactly roomy, has plywood walls, and there's no AC up there for the summer heat. I went back to my routine of riding the bike to and from work, and I haven't been bothered about it anymore by any of my cousin's jerk friends. In fact, they seem to have completely distanced themselves from me and anyone else I know. 
so none of them made any attempt to apologize. But I don't care since I don't really know them. It's just insane that all this was over a used beach cruiser. It's not even an expensive one. I'd like to ask my cousin one day if it was worth it, but I don't want to see his face again anytime soon. So our friend OP here has a cousin who is a walking, talking disaster of a Karen. Like, really? This guy is next level. Remember that old bike OP fixed up? Well, Karen cousin was so not cool about it. He demanded 80 bucks for it, or else he would just take it back. Like, seriously? Who does that? But wait, it gets crazier. Karen cousin goes full Hulk mode and actually punches OP. Like, straight up assault over a bike. I mean, come on, that's just nuts. But don't worry, justice was served. Karen cousin got arrested and our brave OP got their bike back. Talk about a crazy twist, huh? And the cherry on top? Karen cousin is now facing eviction and joblessness. Talk about karma. This whole saga had me in stitches. A Karen's outrageous rampage at the park turned into a horrifying ordeal when she not only tried to steal my property, but also pushed me into a fountain. But that was just the beginning of her relentless actions. She ends up getting charges for attempted murder. Here's what happened in this shocking encounter with an entitled mom. So I was at the park with two of my friends, we'll call them K and H. Some background info, I have depression and anxiety, so when I'm out in public I like to play games on my phone so that I have something to distract me from the world and keep me from panicking. I also have this necklace I wear that I got as a gift from my mom that she got me to kind of play with to calm me down if I'm having an anxiety attack. I never take it off, even in the shower, but it's gold-plated so it doesn't turn my neck green or anything lol. Anyway K, H and I were sitting on a bench taking a break from playing frisbee with H's dog that she had brought along. I was out of breath and sometimes that can remind me of hyperventilating and send me into a panic attack. So while the three of us chatted I opened a game on my phone and began playing. Not even like two seconds after I took out my phone, this snotty kid, maybe like eight or nine years old, came running up to the bench. This is kid. Obnoxious kid. Not okay. Maybe I should have choose a different name for him, haha. Ha. At first I thought he maybe wanted to let H's dog as the dog is very friendly and likes kids. So I turned to H to see if she was talking to the kid. But before I could do anything I felt the kid's grubby hands on mine trying to pull my phone out of my hands. I asked him what he was doing, already getting nervous from having my personal property touched by a stranger. And he said he wanted to play games and continued to try and pry my phone out of my hands. I asked him nicely to stop, but when he didn't, I used my free hand to unclamp his hands from my phone. The instant I even touched him, the obnoxious kid started bawling and screaming, This girl is trying to steal my phone. Now, I was already on the verge of a panic attack, so at this point, one hand was holding my phone and the other was playing with my necklace. Out of nowhere, a lady runs up to the bench and picks the kid up. He had to be at least eight, a little old for getting carried by your mom. She instantly started yelling at us. Um, excuse me, how dare you girls try to lay hands on my son? He just wanted to play your games. You're too old for that anyway. Why don't you just give him the phone? Well, he just ran up to us and grabbed it without saying anything. If I'd have known he just wanted to check out a game, I might have let him play for a little bit. But she cut me off before I could finish. For a little bit? She snort laughed sarcastically. I meant you should just let him have it. Aren't you guys here to be active anyway? Sure looks like you need it. Just give him the phone and get back to your exercises. She looked towards H, who is a little overweight, but very pretty, and actually is more active than I am. This upset H, and her dog could tell, and started growling. You should let me have that dog too. Look, it's growling. It doesn't even like you. My friend K responds, Lady, her dog is growling at you and your son, not us. Karen opened her mouth to say something, but before she could, I screamed. In the midst of this chaos, the obnoxious kid had slipped my phone out of my hands and was running across the park towards the fountain with it. I got up and instantly started chasing him, and caught up to him right as he got to the fountain. By now I was crying and pulling on my necklace so hard it almost hurt. I was about to have a full-blown panic attack. The kid looked at me, and with an evil little kid grin, threw my phone in the fountain. I was so angry that I ran up to the fountain and on my way to jump in to retrieve my phone, I wasn't looking at my surroundings, and I accidentally pushed the kid into the water as well. I got my phone out, but it was totally waterlogged and broken. The kid had climbed out and was now sobbing as K and H ran towards the fountain to help me, with Karen not too far behind them, screaming like a banshee. How dare you try and drown my son! You tried to kill my baby! By now, I am hyperventilating and having a full-blown panic attack. K and H sit next to me on the edge of the fountain and rub my back trying to calm me down. I realized somehow that H didn't have her dog with her and looked around for it, and realized Karen was holding its leash and walking it. Since you didn't give my baby that phone you don't even need, I'm taking this dog. It obviously likes me more than you guys. You are obviously abusing it. H's dog was whimpering and obviously did not like this lady. Look lady, that is my dog, and I have the paperwork to prove it. I will call 911 if you don't give him back. 
Karen screams, Too late! I've already called the police so they can arrest you for attempted murder when you tried to drown my son. Karen stepped closer to me and to my horror started peering at my neck. And since you'll be going to jail, you won't need that! As she said that, she actually, I couldn't believe it either, grabbed my necklace and pulled as hard as she could, breaking the gold chain and spilling the beads all into the fountain. At first I just sat there, mouth agape, not even knowing what to do as she stood menacingly over me. But then, reality kicked in, and I started seeing red, and slapped Karen in the face. She couldn't handle this, obviously, and the last thing I remember before being pushed under the water of the fountain was the kid yelling, Yeah, mommy, get her. After that, everything went black for a few seconds. I don't know if it was due to lack of air or sheer panic and anxiety, but next thing I remember was being pulled out of the water by a cop, sputtering everywhere as he asked if I was okay. My eyes were blurry from the water, but I could hear the obnoxious kids sobbing and see roughly what looked like two other cops cuffing Karen as she screamed about how H's dog was her dog, the phone was her property, and how she was still pressing charges for attempted murder on her son. Another cop was talking to K and H, I guess getting their sides of the story for a statement. My mom came to pick us up from the park that day, luckily the cops were very nice, and while two of them drove Karen and the kid to the station, the other two stayed with me and K and H while we waited for my mom. My mom was shaken up as well after the cops explained to her what had happened, but just glad we were okay. We were both sad about the necklace, but she got me a new one that I think is even prettier, and a new phone as well. Karen was made to reimburse her for both. Last I heard, they were charging Karen with attempted murder on a minor, and the obnoxious kid went to live with his dad in another state. I hope his dad is better and teaches the kid how to be a better person, as he is only a kid, and most of the reason why kids act that way is their parents, so I can't blame all his behavior solely on him. I have to go to court in a few months to testify against Karen, and while a part of me feels like I should have some sympathy, another part remembers how she literally encouraged the destruction of my personal property via her son, tried to steal my best friend's dog, destroyed my personal property in a violent manner, and actually held me underwater, and then I don't feel so bad anymore. If you guys want, I can update here more after I hear more about how the case is going. Apparently she refuses to take a plea deal and says she is not guilty, despite the cops and my friends witnessing it, and luckily Park CCTV capturing some of it so it might even go to trial. Some of this has been in the news in my area. This woman not only tried to steal OP's phone but also pushed them into a fountain like what? But it didn't stop there. Karen even tried to snatch H's dog and destroyed OP's precious necklace. Talk about off the rails. And can we just talk about how this lady accused OP of attempted murder for accidentally pushing her kid into the water? Lady, get a grip. The nerve to say they didn't need the necklace because they're going to jail. Like, hello? Karen, you're the one facing charges. I can't believe this whole fiasco, but I'm so glad OP and their friends had each other's backs through this ordeal. Honestly, I hope that kid learns some better behavior from his dad. A Karen's obsession with homeopathic remedies nearly cost my wife her life when she tried to stop her from receiving life-saving treatments during a medical crisis. Her abusive behavior and dangerous beliefs only worsened as she stayed with us, leading to a near-fatal accident after her passing. Here's what happened. Allow me to introduce you to my late mother-in-law. I'll call her Carol, for the sake of variety. Though I've heard many stories about her, for the most part I'll stick with things that I witnessed myself. There are enough of them. I don't think Carol ever met a new age concept that she didn't like. Her expressed goal was to synthesize all religion, science and mysticism into a unified whole. All of it. To this end, she amassed a large collection of books and stranger objects from her travels, with an especial focus on healing. Her library had volumes about vibration manipulation, curative trampolining, homeopathic color therapy, and on and on. I'm not joking or exaggerating here. Her shelves had lots of admittedly pretty mineral crystals, along with bottles of magic goddess essence water, evaporated away, and bogus radon protectors, powered by diagrams of geometric figures. Her favorite book, based on the number of annotations and sticky notes, was hundreds of pages of word salad about spiritual beings from the star Arcturus, that's Arcturus, spelled with an H, because of H-bar, Planck's constant from physics, except that Planck's constant is denoted by H, and H-bar, is the reduced Planck's constant. It's important to get the details right when you're dealing with spiritual beings. Her pentagonal home was custom-built around an energy vortex that she discovered in the coastal peaks of British Columbia. Carol's parenting was, how shall I put this, more darkly eccentric. She was physically and emotionally abusive to her children. One still has some pencil lead embedded in his hand from when she stabbed him because she wasn't satisfied with his piano practice. She attacked one with a kitchen knife. She started slut-shaming her daughter. 
later my wife, as soon as she grew breasts, for growing breasts. So she forced her daughter to wear two large bathing suits, with the apparent intention of making said breasts look smaller by contrast, but with the actual effect that there were wardrobe malfunctions. She was ashamed that her daughter went into medicine and became a noted specialist, rather than supporting her own non-traditional medical work. My wife got the hell out at age 17, and moved across the country to go to university. For most of the time after that she went relatively low contact. A decade ago my wife suffered from a surgical error which resulted in abdominal sepsis and asked me to call her mother. That made me understand just how deathly serious the situation was. I was to call in the family for what might be the last time. I hadn't grasped that her life was truly at risk until that point. Nothing less would have induced her to try to get her mother to visit. To her credit, Carol hurried out, for what was supposed to be a couple of weeks. It was expected that in that time, my wife would be either dead, or on the road to recovery. Carol stayed in our home, and at first things didn't go too badly. For the most part we just didn't talk about the treatments that my wife was undergoing. Carol did express concern about the antibiotics that were being given, since according to her own views, antibiotics did nothing but harm. But a couple of weeks stretched into a couple of months, and Carol became harder to live with. She was angry when I stroked my wife's hair with my hand because I was blocking the energy from her chakra. She started blaming me for having somehow caused the nausea that the botched surgery was supposed to cure. I drove her out to pick up a magical concoction of essential oils, on the condition that she check with one of the doctors before applying them. I pointed out that if the mixture had the power to heal, then it also had the power to cause harm, which Carol denied. When we got back to the hospital, I nabbed one of the residents when we reached my wife's floor, to ask about that. Carol became furious about that, and it was clear that she had had no intention of talking with the doctors. At home, she became more abusive to me. She was claiming that I was abusing my wife by not letting her have her things in the house. At that point I lost my temper, the first time I'd yelled at a person in literally a couple of decades. I told her that almost everything in sight was actually her daughter's, displacing my stuff. The sofas, the piano, tables and chairs, the bookshelves, and the electronics. The shelves for the CDs and DVDs were mine, but half the contents were hers. Carol wanted to know if I'd be continuing the herbal remedies after she left, and I told her that that was up to my wife. I'd continue them if she wanted, I'd stop them if she preferred. Carol screamed that I was abusing my wife by following her own wishes rather than her mother's. On the night before Carol was finally supposed to be heading out, I was restless. That particular nightmare was about to end, but my wife was still quite ill. I got to thinking about that essential oil mixture, which included both oil of cloves and oil of cinnamon. Those are both strongly irritating if left on the skin, and Carol had been painting my wife's feet with the stuff. Her feet were apparently the correct energy points to draw out the infection. I went online and found the manufacturer's instructions, which specified that the oil needed to be significantly diluted with some neutral oil if it was going to be applied to the skin. Carol hadn't even been using the stuff properly. Well, that explained why the skin on my wife's feet was yellow and starting to peel. But Carol was furious when I calmly pointed out the problems that she was creating, out of ignorance. A few days after Carol left, my wife took a turn for the worse and had to go back into the intensive care unit. And I dreaded the phone call that I had to make, not because of the bad news, but because I anticipated how Carol would react. And she didn't disappoint. If you really loved her, you'd put her back onto the herbal oil and stop the antibiotics. You know perfectly well they don't do a damn lick of good. At which point I hung up. I had other things to worry about. My wife pulled through after months in hospital and three stays in ICU. She's still in poor health. I told her that I was putting my foot down. Under no circumstances was her mother welcome under my roof again. She had grossly abused her privileges as a house guest. I didn't care about the family custom that family members were always welcome to stay as guests. I would not stay under the same roof as her mother. Having heard my stories, and based on her own experiences, my wife agreed. A few years ago, Carol died, much as she had lived. She was diagnosed with metastasized lung cancer. Although she did undergo some real medical therapies, she relied mostly on her quack remedies, pawpaw -paw twig powder, whey protein, immune boosters, and the like. The usual crap that ethics-free swindlers pawn off on desperate sufferers. She firmly believed that all the little white spots on her lung x-rays were a good sign, and that her rapid weight loss indicated that her boosters were draining the cancer away. If there's some existence after death, I hope she came to appreciate all of the harm that she did in life. Except, a couple of nights after she passed away, I was driving from the hospital back to the Energy Vortex house. The rental car's navigation device suggested a shorter route than I'd taken to get there, but that route turned into a back road, into a rough road in the hills, into a track through the forest, and, in pitch darkness apart from my headlights, over a rocky bump and directly into a tree trunk. Luckily, I was traveling slowly and stopped in time. 
As I paused, shaken, I got to wondering if there might be something to Carol's worldview after all, and if her vengeful spirit might have possessed the GPS device, making one last try at killing me. Oh my goodness, this story is wild. OP's mother-in-law, Carol, was something else entirely. The fact that she was physically and emotionally abusive to her children is horrifying enough, but the new age stuff she was into just takes it to another level. The fact that she believed antibiotics did more harm than good and then proceeded to paint OP's wife's feet with undiluted essential oils is just crazy. And then the fact that she tried to tell OP to stop the antibiotics and go back to the herbal oil when his wife was in the ICU is just mind-boggling. I don't blame OP one bit for not wanting her under his roof ever again. What do you guys think? Have you ever had to deal with a Karen like Carol before?